All right, welcome in today, guys, to our Power Hour. Our topic today is how visual and auditory cues support working memory when teaching multiplication and division. So the topic of learning styles is certainly not new. In fact, this topic has been researched over many decades. The one common thing found within this research is that people learn in many different ways and that no two people learn in exactly the same way. So as educators, we're often faced with the challenge of our students not grasping some of those key ideas that we find students struggling with. Um, so often what we're experiencing is a clash of learning styles. So the manner in which materials are being presented may not be aligned with that preferred learning style of that student. And sometimes in those cases, students find themselves themselves failing or struggling. So it's an important topic for us to look at. All right, so today we're gonna to look at a few things. One of them that we'll start with is what are sensory cues? So if we're gonna talk about how do we use those sensory cues, what are they? So sensory cues uh, come into place, you know, at many points in life and also in learning. So in the sensory learning style, it's also known as VAC, it uses the three main sensory receivers. So that would be visual, auditory, kinesthetic. We all know a lot about those and pretty much gear our lessons toward those particular um, areas in terms of engagement. Now, students often prefer one style of learning, which defines that best way for that student to learn new information. Um, you know, visual learners process information through what they see. We know that. They understand and remember best what they see. Now, in the classroom, to appeal to this type of learner, we incorporate arts and crafts, visualizations, uh, spatial activities, lots of demonstrations, diagrams, videos, flashcards, pictures, uh, mind mapping. Those are really great ways to touch that visual learner. Now, auditory learners process information through what they hear. So they like to listen and talk things through. In the classroom to appeal to this type of learner, we incorporate a lot of lectures, group discussions, oral reports, guest speakers, flashcards, mnemonics. These are great ways to touch this type of learner. Then of course we have the kinesthetic learners, which we're not really addressing that sensory style today, but you know, we, we just want to make sure that we know who we're trying to touch. So kinesthetic learners process information from the physical experience of doing and touching. They prefer to be involved physically and manipulate things, you know, for themselves. This is the best way to retain that information and really make a connection. Now in the classroom, um, get students up out of their chairs, you know, um, add in role playing into your lessons, hands on activities, and focus on refining those motor skills, uh, physical movement, or any motions at all will help with this group. So, now when it comes to the sensory cues, you know, we want to consider those auditory and visual aspects. So, sen sensory cues, what are they? Sensory cues are a form of intervention that involve the use of visual, which in the most general form could be something like red tape or flashing lights. It's very visual and very attention grabbing and auditory. So in the, again, in the most general sense, it could be a horn or a bell, um, those type of stimuli, okay? And then there's also um, verbal, which in our case would be the voice of the teacher, parents, um, maybe a counselor, things like that in the school setting. Now, what are visual cues? Visual cues are going to be those concrete object, objects, uh, pictures, symbols, or written words that would provide a child with information about how to do a routine, activity, you know, the behavior, or even a skill. Visual cues can help a child learn a new skill or become more independent with a skill. Um, now, what are auditory cues? So for example, a teacher may hold up two fingers to remind students to quiet down. I'm sure you have many different types of, you know, auditory cues that you're using in your classroom to get students to do certain acts or uh, routines. Auditory cues include words and sounds. So 
So for example, if a student is having difficulty remembering a vocabulary word, the teacher may provide an auditory cue of just the initial sound, okay? Now, for our topic for today, you know, just getting closer to that, we wanna consider mathematics and how in mathematics, how do visual and auditory cues like what we just discussed support that working memory when teaching multiplication and division? So some of you may know, but for those of you that don't, working memory. Working memory is the small amount of information that can be held in our minds and used to execute tasks. It can also be used to reason, decision, make decisions, and in different behaviors. Um, a lot of that comes into place when we're working with mathematics. Um, in contrast, just to make sure we're super clear, long-term memory is that vast amount of memory that's saved you know, over the course of your life. So let's go to our next slide. Now, this is something that a slide that shows a statement here, pointer, a statement here at the top which we'll address in just a moment. But then also we have a side-by-side -side of a problem that we would have within our multiplication, the curriculum, you know, including our multiplication here. And then also just this, this, the same problem, but in its most standard form that you would see in a lot of other curriculum. So some of the visual cues that TouchMath happens to provide are, you know, the place value reminders here in actual words. Um, these are things that are included early on and kept throughout the curriculum until you're ready as the teacher to say, okay, this student does not need this any longer. We've also got, of course, the touch points, which are, you know, one of the main visual cues that we have that we provide early on while we're teaching students those touch points and, and the pattern um, of counting those touch points. Now, the dotted line that goes down the middle is just one of those consistent visual cues in terms of uh, spatial awareness and alignment that we have to keep in mind in multiplication and division and many other types of problems. So those are some that are here for the student to support them in that process, not just how to do the problem, but the process. So one thing to remember is that, um, I'll come back to this, but one thing to remember is what visual and auditory cues do for working memory. In a nutshell, they reduce that load on the working memory. So as we stated, it's the amount of information, that it is the information, a small amount of information that can be held in our brains at a time. So if we're considering a student that's presented with this problem, we want, and a student that is challenged, you know, with learning multiplication and division, at this point, one of the most important things that they need to know in order to solve this problem is going to be that skip counting, which is challenging for many students. We want them to be able to focus on that skip counting to solve the problem. So do we want them to really stress about the process? Where do I begin? Um, you know, where do I write my numbers? Where are my touch points? At that point, even though they may have known their touch points for a really long time, when you're trying to recall your skip counting, the touch points may be a little foggy at that moment. And these supports at this point may be something that that student really needs in order to be able to proceed with their, with their problem. So that gives an idea of, of some of that information there. So, um, all right, keeping in, keeping in mind our visual and auditory cues, you know, what are some of the reasons that we use them? So here at the top, you'll see, we use them as reminders. So for one, in our problems, we have that arrow, that arrow that tells them, where do we begin with our multiplication problems? Even with our addition and subtraction problems, we have that there. Um, in terms of you know, that reminder, something as simple as a sticky note um, or a picture drawn on a sticky note or a little note on the side of a child's desk that helps them with, you know, that process of that problem. Those are some of the things that can be helpful at that moment. Um, posters in front of the students that show a diagram of the directionality of a problem, which leads to the next 
um, use. We use them auditory and visual cues to help with directionality of multiplication and division. We all know that these um, problems have to be done with a certain step, certain process, things happen or things need to happen before other things. If they happen in the wrong direction, in the wrong order, the problem will not be solved correctly. Um, something that a student, so we have the arrow that's there as um, you know, the visual cue that's there for a student. A teacher might actually hold up one number or direct the students to hold up um, the number one on their right hand, which may help to remind them, you know, one's column right side is where I would start that problem. There's lots that we can come up with as teachers when we know the type of learner that we have, which is why we talked about that first, and some of the uh, different types of ways that they respond to things. All right, so let's take a look at this slide. So this slide sort of addresses some of what we talked about, which would be, um, the visual cues and auditory cues as well. So we teach our students, especially within our curriculum, we teach our students some of the important statements to remember when starting a problem. So when we start multiplication, we tell the students, I skip count by one number while touching the touch points of the other number. Now, if a student has this written as a reminder, they say it to themselves right before the teacher is saying it and modeling it. This may be something that the student remembers right away as soon as they start the problem, or the teacher may say it as soon as they're presenting the students with multiplication problems. So that's a great um, auditory cue there. Um, there are also visual cues here to support the students through the process of larger multiplication problems such as these, um, these gray areas, the touch points, the dotted lines, the arrow here, the place value reminders here. So there's a lot built into that problem that's standard, you know, typically not there. Um, those visual cues and auditory cues are part of that bridge that we use to help students who are not able to naturally transition over to doing problems such as these. Um, looking here, we're gonna go, a, 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 well, let's go over to the next slide really quickly and then we'll go back to it. Um, Another reason we use visual and auditory cues is to remind a child um, of the direction of our touch points. So sometimes when we're presenting the initial part of our touch points, we may say the five, you know, think of it as a train going down the tracks. And once that student is, you know, sort of hearing that and remembering, like they think the number five, train tracks. Or how about the number eight with the owl eyes? We say we start at the owl eyes because lots of students say that it looks like an owl. So some of these sort of, you know, reminders and uh, moments where we're making visual connections and, you know, um, sound connections, that's all part of, um, you know, making sense of the numbers, some of the number concepts, some of the processes and related to the multiplication and division problems. Another thing that's really cool is how um, we can use them to remind a child of a meaning, um, to remind a child of a word and its meaning. So for example, um, in division, we tell the students that this is, that this is a garage. And when we're presenting those terms of, you know, the dividend and, you know, even though it's end, E-N-D, lots of us say it quickly, we say dividend, the dividend is in the garage. And that's a connection that sometimes students are able to, to remember. Um, the divisor is outside of the garage and the quotient is on top of the garage. So we're presenting those terms and we're giving them a visual of where they can see it in the problem. Um, these are things that are helpful for certain kinds of learners and that's what we want to do. We will present many different auditory and visual cues and they will not touch every type of learner, but they will connect with some of them. All right, we also have on the same problem, the use of arrows and tally bars um, tally marks and bars for the cues um, on the process to proceed with division. So as soon as students see their division problem here and they see this bar, this uh, box and this bar here that the students automatically would know, okay, I know this process. I know that in this step, I'm going to use my tally marks. And then eventually when they see their division problems, hopefully they can sort of just visualize. And we've seen many students be able to 
visualize that box at the top of their problem, or they just make a space for those tally marks because they remember this is my process. And even though my box is not there, I don't need it anymore. When touch points are no longer there, students still remember what to do with those problems. So we phase out of some of these visual cues. We phase out of some of these auditory cues. They're a bridge to help get them to that next area where that fluency can begin with these problems and they're able to make a better connection. All right. Um, again, keeping in mind, we're reducing the load on that working memory. So visual cues, just a few other tips. Visual cues can back up auditory and verbal memory. So we'll present things throughout our curriculum and throughout math lessons like charts and graphs, timelines, even if they're not extremely necessary for that type of problem, sometimes they are very helpful for having some students make a more concrete connection. Um, we'll use these types of things to show patterns in some of the information that's received. Um, information, can uh, information usually stored in auditory memory can be shifted over to verbal and visual with some creative tactics that we have as well. So sometimes we'll see a math problem being changed over to sort of like an animated cartoon sort of thing. And it's something that we can draw on pictures. For example, here on the screen, a math problem, six times six equals 36. Uh, we may show an imagery of two tired sixes marching through the hot desert to an oasis where 36 is written on the top. Um, some of these types of things create memories in students that are uh, long lasting. And that's what we want. We want to make sure that those students that are not presented or not able to retain and connect with math processes and information in the standard way that it's being presented, we want to create moments such as these to make sure that it, it sticks and that students are able to make a personal connection with it, okay? So that is the information that I have today, reasons why auditory and visual cues are used some of the ways that it's been helpful with multiplication and division. So make sure you join us when we address how it's being uh, used with addition and subtraction as well. Thank you.